I love that. I hope while you were reading that you weren't too nervous to get the words wrong, that we didn't see what we were actually reading. I mean, I, I want us just for a moment just to stop and realize what we just read, that once we were enemies of God, that God looked at us in his wrath and in his judgment, but through what Jesus did for us on the cross, now he welcomes us into this relationship, into being reconciled through him. Church, this is the, this is the anthem of, of the church of Jesus Christ. This is why we're here meeting. We're not here meeting so that we can shake hands with people and see our friends once a week. right? We're not here meeting so that, that we can wear our best and, and look super dapper in front of all, you know, all the, the community. We're not meeting for those reasons. We're meeting because Jesus took us in our sin and in our shame and in our guilt when we couldn't do anything about it and he lifted us up pointed us to the cross of jesus christ and said come and follow me he transforms us i want to talk about america this morning a little bit can we do that talk about america okay here we go i, I i'm not asking permission i'm just going to do it all right so americans today are among the most educated people on planet earth more than half of all Americans hold college degrees, and that's not typical around the world. We are also some of the wealthiest people on planet Earth. Okay, so just talking pure numbers, this may not be true for you, uh, but it, it's true just in, in pure numbers. The average American makes $50,000 a year, okay? So the rest of the world, most of the people in the rest of the world will never see $50,000 in their entire lifetime. Right? We, we live longer than most people on earth because we have access to better quality health care than what's available in, in most places around the world. We, most of us, many of us own a home and own at least a car or maybe two cars, sometimes three cars. That's not the trend worldwide. We enjoy more luxury than almost anybody else on earth. But... Every year, almost every year, America ranks in the top two or three in depression, anxiety, and alcohol and drug abuse in the countries of the world. All right, so there's this disconnect here. Do you see this? Like, we have so much, and yet we hurt so much. There's this, this disconnect in us. And let me tell you why I think this is. I think it's because we are so committed and so focused on things and on, on, on the material wealth of this world. And we're searching for happiness in the things in our life, in, in, the, in our jobs, in, in our possessions, in our relationships. Well, let me tell you something, church. Those things will never satisfy us. Ever. It doesn't matter how much money you have, you'll always need more, right? There's never an amount. I, I remember when I was a kid, Bill Gates became the, the, the richest man on earth, and he, had, he was worth something like $90 billion. That's B, billion. And they asked him what he wanted, or what more could you possibly want, and he said, more, Right? And I think now in the intervening years, he's kind of changed and he's become more of a philanthropist. But the thing is, the things in this world are so disappointing, ultimately disappointing. We, we like them for a second. They, they give us joy for a second and then it's fleeting. Think about it, your kids on Christmas Day. Right? Isn't, 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 doesn't it warm your heart when your kid opens a, a, birth, or a Christmas present and it's just there's joy on their face? Unless you give them socks. You ever give them socks or something like that? And then the look on their face like, seriously? This is, this is what you gift wrap. No, but so you see this, this joy. Wow, it's a toy. I can't wait to play with it. I can't wait to do this. And then ask them and look at their face one day later. That toy is broken already. It's, in, it's, it's, it's already been smashed to pieces. Things in this world, the, the joy that it gives us is so temporary. So temporary. But this morning, I want to talk to you about a place where you can find joy that lasts. Eternal joy. The kind of joy that makes a Baptist dance, all right? I'm not going to dance for you. That, that would be beneficial for no one. But the, the joy that, that Jesus Christ brings into your life, what we just read about here, what you guys responded with, that love that he poured out on us produces a joy in us that nothing in this world can match. The Apostle Peter wrote this. You don't have to go here in the book of 1 Peter, but this is what he wrote. Though we have not seen him... You love him. He's talking about Jesus. 
Though not seeing him now, you believe in him and you rejoice with inexpressible and glorious joy because you're receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. See, the things in this world bring us temporary happiness, but the new car smell only lasts so long, right? You ever get into a car and just think, when did, when, like, when did it become this? Mindy drove my car this week, and it wasn't a pleasant experience for her. I'm, I, I, like, I like my office to stay tidy and neat, but my car is just a tool. It just, I just go with it. And so she came in and she said, I can't even drive in this thing. It's so messy. And so I came in and I was like, oh, wow, she organized and she did everything and made it all nice and clean. But the thing is, th those things are temporary. The things that we pursue so often are relationships, uh, the, 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 the jobs that, that we hold, the things that we want in this world, the, the happiness that they produce is so temporary. But when you come to Jesus Christ in faith, he produces something that gives you lasting joy, eternal Eternal joy. So we're going to talk about this this morning. Last week we started this series called Be Love. And we talked about a man. What was his name? Are you with me, church? John. Good. Okay. So if you weren't here last week, I'll, I'll let you slide on that one. But this man's name was John. He was an apostle. In fact, he was one of the, one of the closest people to Jesus that has ever existed, right? He had a, a more intimate relationship and a closer relationship to Jesus than any of the other disciples. They called him John the Beloved. And what did he call himself? I love this. This is my favorite thing. What did John call himself? The disciple that Jesus loved. I, that, that makes me just laugh every time because it's like, out of all the things you could have said, I am the one. I'm the disciple that Jesus loved. But he was closer to Jesus than almost anyone else. And we saw last week how when Jesus called him to come and follow him, it transformed John's life. Then, 60 years later, John writes some letters to some of the people and some of the churches that he served, and you can trace every word that he said in his letters back to something that Jesus told him or he heard Jesus teach in his lifetime. Jesus transformed everything about this guy. So that's what I want to do today. I want to talk about how God's love transforms our joy, transforms our joy. Are you happy this morning? Wow. Wow. <laughs> That was fun. Are you happy? Yeah. yeah it's a, who, had a, who had a great week? I mean, a fantastic week. Best week of your life. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Jeff Tunnel. Best week of your life. Who had a so-so week? Just kind of in the middle. Who had, who had kind of a, just a week that you wish you could just erase and, and move past? A couple people. So most of us, this is where most of us are. In the middle. Our lives are okay. Not good, not bad, but when we view this in terms of eternity, church, listen to me. When we view this in terms of eternity, we were enemies of God. We had nothing to our name, no merits, no claims. We deserve nothing from the Lord, and He lifted us up. Church, that alone, the fact that Jesus looked at us and answered our prayers and saved those of you who believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior, that should make us want to stand up and shout hallelujah. Okay, but we've, we've accustomed ourselves to this kind of neutral place. I'm not bad, I'm not good, I'm just kind of in the middle, right? I want to I wanna, I wanna look at some joy this morning in Scripture. Go with me to John chapter 15, verse 9. The Gospel of John chapter 15, verse 9. We're going to read some words of Jesus this morning. My goal is to, to see some joy well up inside of us. Now, a smile is not always the best indicator of joy, because you can smile through pain, can't you? Like when you're at the dentist and you're like, I wish I could punch you right now, <laughs> but uh, we're not going to. So uh, go with me to John chapter 15, verse 9. And when you have it, I'm going to ask you to stand and give honor to God's word. I know you've stood a lot today, but just think about this. When Jesus walked the earth, the teachers of the law, they were the ones who sat and the people stood. So you're fortunate that you get to sit today. John, I'm just messing with you. I hope I'm just trying to lighten us up a little bit here. John chapter 15, verse 9. John chapter 15, verse 9. What do you notice? If you've got a red letter edition of your Bible, that kind of gave it away. What do you notice about the whole page that you're looking at right now? It's all red. It's, it's, this is all red. What does that mean? 
This is, this is Jesus' words that he spoke this. In fact, he spoke this to his disciples on the way to the Garden of Gethsemane before he was about to be betrayed, arrested, beaten, mocked, and then eventually crucified. So these are important words. Every word of God is important. But these specifically, this is Jesus' last sermon before he ends up going to the cross. So we see this in uh, John 15, verse 9. Listen to these words. As the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Did you catch that? As the Father has loved me, this is Jesus saying, I have also loved you. Remain or abide in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you these things, so that your joy, no, I have told you these things so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Why don't we pray before I, before I dive into this? Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you that you would look at sinners like us. We were broken and we were needy. And the king of all creation looked at us in love and offered us something we never could have earned on our own, and that's relationship with you, reconciliation with you, justification through you, and ultimately glorification, heaven, because of what you've done. I am so grateful this morning, Lord, that I can say without a shadow of a doubt that I believe in the name of Jesus Christ, that he has saved my soul, and that one day I will see him with my own eyes. And I pray that that would be the, the confession of every person in this room, that we believe in you, that we trust in you, that you are our Savior. And this morning, Lord, give us joy. Give us something more than what this world provides. You, you told us that you've come so that we could have life and, and live it more abundantly. And I ask you for that a piece of it this morning, Lord. Help us to follow you and see that. We love you, Lord, and we give you this time. Bless the reading of your word. In your name, amen. All right, you can be seated. I had a pastor that I worked with um, in our first church, in our first ministry, in a little town called Chico, Texas. So you might know where that is over there by Decatur. But he would get up in front of the church and he would say this almost every week. He would say, are you, are you joyful today, church? And at the beginning, people would be like, yeah, yeah, okay. And he would say a word and it kind of gets stuck in, he would say something to him and it kind of gets stuck in my mind. He would say, y'all look like you've been sucking on some lemons, right? And, and I, I think that's the case. Sometimes we live our lives and even though we know what Christ has done for us, how he changed our eternity, we went from death unto life, we still walk around like this. Bless me if you can, Pastor. Right? And I, I, but I want us to look and I want us to realize that we get too comfortable sometimes in, 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 our, in our faith and in our walk with Christ. And we become so accustomed to hearing John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his, his one and only son. We, we hear that so many times, it's like, yeah, we know that. Jesus loves us. Great. I want us to stop and realize what that means. Right? We, were, we were sinners. We were separated from God. There was a wall between us. There was a, a chasm between us that nobody could cross. And Jesus crossed that. And he built a bridge across it with the cross of Calvary in order to invite us into relationship with us, uh, with him. Let me, let me show you this in John chapter 15. One of the things that, that I, I saw really quick as I, as I read through this this week and studied through this. Let me read it. And I want you to be looking for one word that shows up five times. One word shows up five times. As the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that, your, that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. Anybody see the word? Two-letter word. You're like, oh my gosh. I didn't know we were going to be taking a test today. M-Y. My. Five times it shows up. He talks in verse 9 about my love. He talks in verse 10 about my commands or my word. And he talks in verse 11 about my joy. All right, so if, if it's his love and his commands and his joy, what do you think that tells us about our relationship and, and, and salvation through Jesus Christ? What do you think that tells us? It's him. It's his 
It's his. He did it. We didn't do it. I didn't earn it. I didn't come to Jesus and say, I have done this many good things in my life, and I earn salvation. Thank you very much. It's like when you go to Subway and you earn the rewards. Like, 10th sub is free, and you're like, I've eaten nine subs. This is my 10th sub. I get it free. It's not like we came to the Lord and said, I've done all these good things, and now I get, I get your love for free, right? No, he says it's for free, but it's not based on the things that you've done. It's based on one thing that Christ Jesus did for us. He hung on the cross and gave his life for us. So I think about this, that it's it's his. And if we want anything more than what this world provides and the temporary disappointing pleasures of this world, then we got to find another source for our joy. Because obviously it's not working in the things that we're looking for. So Jesus here, I want you to look at two things. So his joy. Number one is going to be his joy in us. And number two, I'll let you go ahead, his joy through us. His joy in us and his joy through us. So we're going to look at this. Look at verse 9 with me. As the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. How much do you love your kids? Can you measure it? Can you put a number on it, like a percentage? Are there days where you love them a little bit less than you did the day before? Are there days you love them a little bit more than you did the day before, right? When, when, when they're, you know, they don't scream all night at 3 a.m.? That's, that's, that's fun for a little four-month-old. But you look at this. We, we, we can't put a number on this. We, we love our kids, right? But this is what Jesus says for us. This is, a, this is a truth that we need to take home today. God says, as much as God loves his son, Jesus Christ, that's how much love he loves you with. Isn't that incredible? You remember the moment when Jesus was baptized and the heavens opened and the Holy Spirit came down like a dove, right? What did God say? What did the voice of God say? If there's any biblical scholars here. Good, I hear, I hear you. This is my beloved son. This is my son whom I love and in him I am well pleased. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ this morning, then God looks at you no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been. If you are one in Christ, he looks at you and says, that's my beloved son. That's my beloved daughter. I am well pleased in them. The same love that God has for Jesus Christ, he has for you and me Today. This is incredible love, inexpressible, inexhaustible, infinite love that we, I can't think of any more in, in words. It was off the top of my head, that was good. But as we, as we look at this, we, 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 can't, we can't express this love that he has for us. I've got another sermon up here, I've got to keep track of where I am. All right, so that's great, Pastor. Thank you very much for a a sermon on God's love, right? Don't you love to be loved? Doesn't that, doesn't that feel good? But how does that have anything to do with my joy? I'm, I'm so glad you asked. You guys are being real, real good and communicative with me today. No. How, 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 how does that work? If, if God loves us, I know God loves me, but maybe I still don't have joy in my heart. What, where's the disconnect? How, how do I get that joy that Peter talked about in my heart? How, how does that work? Let me illustrate it to you with Chloe. So she's over there right now. She is in kindergarten learning math, basic math. Now, I'm not a math person, but I like kindergarten math, right? That's, 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 that's the math I know how to do. And so we'll, we'll, when we go to bed at night, she'll ask me a question. Daddy, ask me a math question. And so we'll say, what's two plus three? And those, those little ones, she knows real quick. She's like five. Just give me something harder. And so I'll say, okay, what's five plus six? And she'll say, 11. And then we'll keep adding and adding and getting more complicated and more complicated, all right? So, and she's really good at it. She's really good at, at doing her, her little math. But the thing is, the formula stays the same, right? A plus B equals C. Whatever numbers you put in there, it's, it's going to be the same. Now, that's as far as I'm going to go with math, because math is a, a tool of, of Satan himself to, to confuse people. But as we look at this, A plus B equals C. And so God gives us the formula for joy here in this passage. He says, my love plus my word and your obedience equals my joy. Love plus obedience equals joy. 
Say it with me, church. Love plus obedience equals joy. He's saying, because I've loved you to the degree that I've loved you, it demands an obedient response from you. And when you walk with me in that relationship of obedience, you're going to see joy like you've never seen before come into your life. Now, the problem is we like to change the, the equation, right? We want to erase B from the equation. We want love and joy. I, want, I just want to go through my life and have everything be great, right? Don't you? Don't, does ever, did anybody ever wake up and say, I would like some really severe emotional problems today, right? Nobody says that. We want God's love and we want God's joy, but sometimes people aren't willing to bend the knee to him as Lord and be obedient. But you can't change the formula. Love plus obedience equals joy. Other people want to do away with the first part, and they just want to do obedience equals joy. They want to follow a list of rules. They want to say, if I go to church, if I give my tithe, if I sing in worship, if I serve in second and third grade Sunday school, then I'll have joy. But the problem is that's man-made religion. That's just ritual. You can't change the formula. God's love that he pours out in us creates obedience in those that know him and love him, which produces joy. And not just any joy. Tell me what joy means to you. No wrong answers. Complete. You just say what's on the top of your head. What does joy mean to you? Peace? Comfort? Happiness. Good. Right? You know when you're joyful, right? People know when you're joyful because you come into church and you don't look like this. I wonder what he's going to preach on today. But it's going to be boring. When's it going to be? All right. But when you come, when you, when you live your life and you, you say, you know what? God loved me to this degree. I'm going to live my life in joy. I don't mean walking around like bouncing around like a crazy person. I just mean taking and having confidence in your life. You know, whatever happens, whatever trials come, I'm going to have joy through it all because I know that God loves me. And in the end, I'll see him face to face. I look at this and I think the joy that God produces in us. Jesus said, it's, it's my joy in you. And when that happens, your joy will be complete. I'm going to teach you some Greek this morning, all right? Can we do that? We're going to learn some Greek. The word that God uses, or Jesus uses here for joy is, all right, get some saliva going. Chara. Can we say that? Chara. All right. I don't, know, I don't know why I sound like a pirate when I say it, but it's like, chara. Right? You got to give a good to it. That joy, it's a really hard word to translate, but, but we use it all the way throughout the New Testament. And that word chara has an idea of the joy and the delight and the happiness of a wedding ceremony, a wedding day. Specifically, it's used in a couple of places to describe the smile on a bride's face. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that, isn't that a wonderful way that we can look at it? Husbands, think back on your wedding day. All right, as for some of you, I know it was quite a long time ago. But stop and just think what, you, what your bride looked like when you were walking down the aisle. Was, isn't that an amazing moment? I bawled throughout my whole wedding. Like as soon as I saw, I came around the corner, I saw him, oh, 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 look at I do, right? It was horrible, but... I remember her face and I remember her smile. It was joy. It was pure joy. That's the best word that we can come up with that Jesus employed in, in, in the limited language that we have to, to describe the joy that he gives. But you know what he's saying is that's not enough. The joy that he provides and that he puts in you because we don't, we don't manufacture it. We don't create it. We can't muster up more of it. I can't wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to be more joyful today. All right, I can't do that. The book of Galatians chapter 5 says the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, and patience. Right? This is something that the Lord does. And the, 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 the joy that he produces in your life is the idea of overwhelming, complete, abundant, overflowing joy. God wants you to have that kind of joy. He doesn't want us to walk around sad and miserable lives just waiting for the Lord to come home. I, I mean, that's, 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 that's so, so many Christians, we live through this, we go through this life saying, well, oh, it's a terrible world we live, and I just can't wait for Jesus to come back. And it's great that we anticipate His return, but while we are here, we live in joy. We live a joy-filled life, not based on our circumstances, but based on what Christ did for us. Love plus obedience equals joy. Okay, now all of that being said, 
John heard this. John took this in. Now we're going to see how John made it practical. Because the Gospels, the truths in the Gospel of John are made practical in the letters of John. So go with me almost to the end of your Bibles, to the book of 1 John. 1 John. So we saw his joy in us, that he wants to produce in us something that we can't produce in ourselves. Now I want to look at John's response to that. His joy through us. So 1 John chapter 1, and I'm just going to read verse 4 here. 1 John chapter 1, verse 4. I hear pages turning, so I'll give you some time. 1 John chapter 1, verse 4. He says, we are writing these things so that your joy may be complete. You hear that? Where have we heard that phrase before? We just said it. I trust in you. The answer is always right. It's Jesus. It's, it's, it's all, you're, you're never going to be wrong to, to say that. So, so he heard Jesus say... I say these things to you so that my joy will be in you and your joy may be complete. And then 60 years later, John writes these words. We are writing these things so that your joy may be complete. And then look at this. Go to the book of 2 John. It's right next to it. Just turn a couple of pages. In my entire ministry, I've never taught one verse from 2 John. So this is, this is a first for me and maybe for you too. In 2 John, look at verse 12. 2 John, it's, there's only one chapter, so it's real short. In verse 12, it says, Though I have many things to write to you, I don't want to use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to come to you and talk face to face so that our joy may be complete or maybe full, right? Look at this. He's using the same words that Jesus used. Now, is he plagiarizing Jesus? You guys who are uh, teachers or, or administrators or educators, right? You would, you would probably, you'd probably say, hey, you, you're not allowed to plagiarize. He's not trying to steal Jesus' words. Jesus' words and his truth have so embedded themselves into John's heart, it flows out of him. Right? Because we are not meant to be bulls. We talked about this last week. What are we meant to be? Strainers. Good. So who got that? Who said that? Is it somebody down here? Somebody over here? Somebody said it. Strainers. I'm so glad you said that because that's, that, that was a, a, a word that we talked about last week. So we're not meant to be bold. We're not meant to just receive, receive, receive and let it end with us. We're meant to be strainers. It pours out into the life of others. So John received this joy from the Lord. And now he's writing to different people saying, I want you to receive and experience the same kind of joy that transforms your life. But remember our formula. What was our formula we talked about? Love plus obedience equals joy. Now go with me to the book of 3 John. Turn over one more page to 3 John. We're going to read verses 3 and 4. This is to a completely different person, a different situation. He's writing three different letters. He says in, in 3 John chapter 3, or verse 3, For I was very glad when fellow believers came and testified to your fidelity to the truth, how you are walking in truth. That's obedience. Verse 4 says, I have no greater, what? Joy than this, to hear that my children are walking in truth. Everything that he learned from Jesus, everything that, that he heard taught by the mouth of Jesus, it transformed him and he pours it out into the lives of others. He's saying, I'm, I'm walking in God's love and obedience and it's producing joy. And now I'm so happy that in the second generation of Christians, I'm seeing you do the same thing. And church, I, I, this, is, this is my purpose. That, that verse right there is one of my life verses. I want the people that I serve and the people that I shepherd to walk in truth. Because love plus obedience equals joy. I don't want you to be miserable. Right? I don't look at any of you and say, you know what? I hope that guy has a bad day. No, no never say that. I want you to have joy. I want you to experience the, the transforming joy that Christ brings into your life. Just like John did here. Love Plus obedience equals joy. I'm going to ask our praise team to come up and, and lead us in a song of invitation. But I, I'll, I'll say this just to end. I think there's probably some people in this room who have yet to experience God's love. Maybe they've, maybe they've been obedient for a while and they've been playing the church game and they've been doing the things that they're supposed to do. But they still haven't gone to the source 
and may become one with Christ Jesus. I want to give you that, that opportunity this morning. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, this invitation is for you. We are sinners. The Bible says in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But we just like we read earlier with, with Cassidy, we, we understand this, that, that God looked at us in our sin and He sent Jesus Christ to pay the penalty for our sin, to absorb the wrath of God that was meant for us. And now in return, He offers us his free gift of salvation. See, your sin was put on Jesus on the cross, and it died with him. And when he rose from the dead, your sin stayed buried. So now if we come to him in faith and say, Lord, I can't do this on my own, and I need you to be my Savior, I want you to be my Lord, the Bible says when you call upon the name of the Lord, you shall be saved. If you've never made that choice to, to come before Jesus, confess your sins, and choose Him as your Lord and Savior, I want you to do that this morning. I want you to come up and talk to me. I'm not going to lead a prayer where, where you can repeat it, because it's not the prayer that saves you. All right? I, I'm not a big fan of, of just saying, anybody wants to pray this prayer, pray with me, because it's not, it's not a magic prayer. It's not the prayer that saves. It's the heart of faith that says, Lord, I, I need you and your salvation and who believes in Jesus Christ. So if you need to be saved this morning, while the, while the praise team sings and while we stand, I just want, I want to invite you to come down and talk to me, make that decision this morning. Church, why don't we go to the Lord in prayer? Father, we love you, Lord. And we know that it wasn't because we first loved you, but you first loved us. You took the initiative. You, you were the one who, who started this process. Before this world was even made, you had already made a plan to put Jesus on the cross, to take the, the suffering and the shame and the guilt and the condemnation for my sin. I pray this morning, if there is somebody in this room that has yet to enter into a relationship with you, I pray that this morning would be the morning that changes everything. Lord, I pray that you would move in this time of invitation. We ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.